Alrighty gang, who's ready to put on some body armor, duct tape some phone books to your arms, and aim for the head? Because today we are fighting zombies in Zack Snyder's newest movie, Army of the Dead. This movie marks Snyder's second film of this genre, having his first directorial debut be Dawn of the Dead back in 2004. We have a lot to discuss, and I want to get into all of it because I am so excited to talk about this movie. So without further ado, this is Red Eye Reviews. Now before we dive into this thing, I just want to give you all a little bit more about myself. For those of you that don't know, I am a huge horror movie fan. I really cannot get enough of this stuff, but my favorite type of horror movie are zombie films. And I can't tell you how many times I have seen 28 Days or Weeks Later, Dawn of the Dead, Shaun of the Dead, or even Wan of the Dead, and yes, that is a real movie and it is great. I really can't get enough of this genre. And what makes it so great is that regardless of the quality of movie, it's going to be entertaining. So if you all love zombie movies, expect some of those videos to hit the channel in the future because I would love to talk zombies. Fortunately for us today, the zombie movie we are talking about is Army of the Dead, and it is really, really good, I think. I think it's pretty great. So with all of my videos, we will start with a full plot synopsis, and because this is a brand new movie, I will be providing a timestamp to skip this part of the video if you don't want it spoiled. Our movie starts with a military convoy transporting a top-secret package. However, a newly married couple gets distracted with some sexy car time and crashes into the convoy, damaging the package and allowing Patient Zero to escape. That's right. The zombie outbreak was caused by a blowjob. We get an incredible intro into our main characters, and we see who they are as the walls are being built to lock in the city of Las Vegas and keep the dead inside. We cut to modern day, and we learn that the military plans on dropping a nuclear bomb on Vegas to destroy the zombies once and for all. However, before that happens, a casino owner has devised a plan. Hire a crew of mercenaries to retrieve his money from the casino vault, and split some of it with them for their payout. Because while the insurance covered his losses, he would like to kind of double up his money and retrieve the original cash also. $200 million. And he'll give Scott Ward $50 million to divide up however he sees fit. And then we get our kind of Ocean's Eleven crew hiring. Picking up some old friends, a helicopter pilot, a safe cracker, and some firepower. We go over the plan itself, and we learn that while they can't fly helicopters into the city, you can fly one out. And there is still one on the roof of the casino. The only way into the city, however, is through a camp of refugees, where Scott Ward, played by Dave Bautista, his daughter, works at the refugee camp. So with her and the help of a lady called the Coyote, the gang enters Vegas. After the daughter learns that the Coyote also helped a fellow refugee into Vegas, and she hasn't come out yet, she decides to join the group and go into the city in order to find her friend. The Coyote brings along a guard to help them, but actually uses him as bait as an offering to the Alpha Zombies. Because while they have left this city alone, multiple types of zombies have developed. We have our slow-walking typical zombies, and then we have the things called the Alphas, which are very smart and organized and fast. More of our 28 Days Later type zombies. But an unspoken truce has been made with them that they will leave these guys alone if they give them an offering to be turned into another alpha zombie, which is where this guy comes in. And don't worry about this guy, he's kind of a total asshole, so we don't really feel bad for him at all. He gets taken to the leader and gets bitten, so I'm sure we'll see him again. The gang then uses the interior of buildings to travel through the city to avoid confrontation with the alphas out in the public. And while going through a building, the man who works for the casino owner, who has come along to make sure nobody gets out of line, and everybody knows he's a double-crosser, gets into an argument with one of the crew, and double-crosses her. Who would have thought? Which in turn gets her eaten by zombies. The gang gets to the casino and starts to fuel up the generator as well as the helicopter on the roof. Meanwhile, the safecracker and a couple of gunmen head to the basement to start getting into the safe itself, and the coyote and the casino henchmen sneak outside and capture the Alpha Queen. The coyote believes that he's just going to take a blood sample, but the henchman decides to cut off her whole head and put it into a bag, saying if he brings it back, it could be worth a lot of money to the right buyer. But obviously this is the stupidest move in movie history, because we all know this is going to come back to bite them. Pun definitely intended. Down in the basement, they trick a zombie into triggering all the traps leading up to the vault so they can walk up to the door safely. And while they're inside of Vegas, they learn that the government has decided to move the nuking of the city up an entire 24 hours due to caving into pressure. So now their one-day window has turned into about an hour and a half, and they are really feeling the pressure, and they're in a bit of a bind. 
And meanwhile, our zombie king rides his dope zombie horse and finds his decapitated bride. And to make it even worse, I guess our zombie was pregnant with a little zombie baby. So I'm sure that's going to work out fine for our heroes. And look, things are going great. Because they do get the vault open, and they're super rich now. You know, if they could somehow get out of here in time. Which they only have about 20 minutes left to do so. So it's not looking too great. And to make matters worse, our alpha zombies are absolutely ready to destroy anything and everything in their path. And our daughter Kate has run off in an attempt to find her lost friend, who they believe has been taken captive by the zombies, to eventually be turned into an alpha, but they're just hanging on to her for some reason. And now, the real fun begins because our zombies come storming in and start to attack everybody. We see that the henchman has, not surprisingly, betrayed the entire group, claiming that it was never really about the money, and they only really wanted the head of this alpha zombie, as it is worth much, much more. Our leader zombie does probably the smartest thing any zombie has ever done in a movie, and put on a helmet. Yeah, can't destroy the brain now, can you, you dumb humans? Our heroes get separated, our safecracker sacrifices himself to save his newfound friend, and our henchman goes to escape, but he learns that the coyote actually swapped the zombie head with a money-counting machine, but even if he did have the head, it wouldn't really have mattered, because Siegfried's killer tiger absolutely destroys the guy, and it's real nasty. We get the classic zombie move, which I have seen so many times, but I love, and it's where the guy pulls all of his grenade pins out, and he goes down in a blaze of glory and takes a ton of zombies with him, and as they make their escape, the coyote then uses the queen's real head, which she has, to stall the leader alpha so they can get onto the helicopter. However, she gets captured, and as a final sort of FU, she drops the queen's head off the roof, and we think she's dead. We assume she's dead. We don't see her actually die, but we don't see her again. So Scott and the pilot go to rescue his daughter, Kate, who has actually found her friends. And while attempting to get out, the alpha comes back, and we see that helmets still work. All these zombies should have worn helmets, but maybe they only had one. The final group heads to the roof just in time to see our helicopter pilot has pieced out. Just kidding. She leaves for about two minutes to create some drama and is just, yeah, she's back. And to add more to it, the leader alpha has caught up to them and he makes his way onto the helicopter. And even though they somehow manage to shoot the pilot in the shoulder, they get out of the city just in time before the nuke explodes and even manage to kill the alpha zombie. However, our fearless leader has sadly been bitten. And in the aftermath of the bomb... The helicopter's crashed, Kate sees that the pilot has died, and her dad is barely hanging on. We get our final touching scene between daughter and father, and he gets zombified and she has to put him down. Years of therapy to come for her, but in our final moment, we see Vander has survived inside the vault and carries an absolute shit ton of money out of the city. We're going to pretend nuclear fallout doesn't exist uh, because they forgot about it because he just gets out. He uses some of this money to rent a private jet and has a grand old time, or so we thought. Turns out our boy was actually bit by the alpha zombie himself and is about to unleash some serious hell on Mexico City, and our movie ends here. So before we really get into it, I want to start off by saying I thought this movie was great. It's just mindless fun. You really shouldn't overthink it that much. I tend to overthink movies, but you really shouldn't, because if you try to find holes in its plot or you try to figure out why certain characters behave a certain way, you will obviously find faults. But this movie's not supposed to be a deep thinker. It's just gory, zombie-killing fun, and it's awesome. Now, it's been 17 years since Zack Snyder remade Dawn of the Dead, which, if you've seen that movie, I think we all can agree it's one of the best zombie movies ever made. And I think this movie is up there. Now, one of the very first things you will notice in this movie is the cinematography. Snyder has chosen to film a very large portion of the movie with an extremely shallow depth of view, so we get a single subject in frame and the entire background is blurred. And it works well, I think, as it helps us focus on the exact thing Snyder wants us to look at. So if he wants us to pay attention to Batista, we get just Batista. If he wants us to focus on the zombie queen, we get just her. There's even this great bit where the queen steps backwards out of focus, and we're just left with a blurry screen. And I think it's really interesting. I don't think I've seen a movie lean so heavily into this style of filming before, but it does work for the most part. I think he might have used it a bit too much, but I mean, this is a Snyder film. That's what he's known for doing. He overindulges and he gives us too much in every one of his movies. But this stylized approach to filming gives us some incredible scenes where you can really feel the atmosphere and the tension. You feel more personal with the characters. However, something I've always had an issue with when it comes to a Snyder film are just their lengths. This one comes in at two and a half hours, and I don't think it needed to be nearly that long. I have similar complaints with like Justice League, 
because somewhere in these super long epics is a really great two-hour movie. But we can never get out of a Snyder film without our slow motion scenes or letting a scene run just a few seconds longer than it probably needed to be. And I know this sounds nitpicky, but it's a constant theme with Snyder films, and it's really my main issue I have with his movies on a pretty consistent basis. But even at two and a half hours, I would say I was never bored. I did thoroughly enjoy every minute of this movie, but it's probably because it's my favorite genre of movie, it being a zombie flick. Another small complaint I have, which really isn't a big deal, but I feel some of the effects near the end of the movie don't really hold up to the same quality as the rest of the movie. Like, we get some great shots like this where we can see the virus actually go into the guy, and right as it hits his eyes, his eyes open. Awesome. And this isn't spoiling anything because they talk about it in the trailer, but they only have this small window of time to get the money out of Vegas because there's a nuke that the military plans on dropping and destroying the city with. And when that moment does happen in the movie, the quality of the effect there just felt rather poor. Or there's a helicopter shortly after that bit, and it just doesn't feel quite right either. Maybe the lighting or something, I don't know. But the effects don't hold up to the rest of the movie's effects, and I think it's pretty apparent. Okay, my last complaint before I talk about what I really liked is with Tig Notaro's character. So for those of you that didn't know, this movie was originally filmed with Christy Elia as the pilot, but after the stories broke about him pursuing underaged girls, Zack Snyder made the obviously right decision and pulled him from the film, but he had already filmed everything with him, and it was basically wrapped at that point. So he called in Tig Notaro, who filmed all of her scenes alone, and then they just digitally added her in place of Chris. And I suppose if I didn't know that going into the movie, it might not have been as apparent, but you start to realize that she barely interacts with any of the other characters, her dialogue feels a bit out of place in response in certain scenes, and there's even a few scenes that you can kind of really tell that she was digitally added. And I love Tig Notaro. I think she's a great actress, but it is very apparent that her character was kind of an afterthought that was rushed in at the last second. And now beyond the obvious reasons for loving this movie, which is that it's a zombie movie and it's just pure unapologetic fun, one of the main reasons this movie is great is because of Dave Bautista. I was very pleasantly surprised with his performance. I knew that he was funny and lighthearted after seeing him in Guardians of the Galaxy, but his dramatic acting was really good. Easily the best character in the movie, and without a doubt, the much-needed glue to tie these mismatched, awkward crew of people together. The other reason to love this movie is its use of sound and music. So just to add some background info, there is an incredible musician named Richard Cheese. He does classy, piano bar, jazzy renditions of a ton of songs. And he's probably most well known for his rendition of Down with the Sickness from Dawn of the Dead. Get up, come on, get down with the sickness. Which I think we can agree is awesome. Snyder made a very smart decision and brought him back to perform Viva Las Vegas for this movie. Viva Las Vegas! And it's just as awesome. I think it's a perfect level of fun, lighthearted, and downright depressing a bit, and it fits the movie's tone exactly, and cements him as my personal favorite cover artist, hands down. So with all of that in mind, I'm going to give this movie a solid 8 out of 10. It has everything I want out of a zombie movie, and it's made its way into my favorite list of zombie films, number one being 28 Days Later, and a close second is actually 28 Weeks Later, both of which, in my opinion, are the best zombie films ever made. If you like zombie films, let me know your thoughts on this movie and others. It's currently on Netflix as of today, and I 100% think you should watch it if you like zombie. So with that, thank you so much for watching. Please make sure to subscribe if you haven't. Like the video, hit the bell, do the stuff, aim for the head. We will see you in the next one, and until then, stay happy and stay healthy.